uh, if traffic is a sign of growth, uh, then there has been a lot of growth, uh, I saw uh, this morning. Uh, but uh, traffic then also becomes an impediment for future growth. And that's actually what this story uh, is about. Uh, because there are already uh, uh, economic problems emerging. And it is not at all certain that Bangladesh will be able to continue to grow at a fast pace and continue to diversify, which you need for sustainable uh, growth. And in our view, and that is coming from that vast body of work that we have been working on the last couple of years, the lack of inclusion in the productive economy is a key structural impediment that makes the current problems difficult to solve, but also makes future growth uh, very uh, uncertain. So more people should be included in the productive economy to address all these issues that uh, Bangladesh is facing now. Then two observations about the future. Uh, first of all, uh, never waste a good a crisis, uh, because a crisis creates opportunities. You see that always, whether that is a global crisis or a local crisis, after that, normally the world is never the same again. And why is that? Because a crisis often triggers new technologies to solve problems that have uh, arisen. Uh, there is always that Schumpeterian uh, creative uh, destruction that creates new opportunities. You see often, uh, especially at a global scale, new divisions of labor emerging in economics. We often see even new economic paradigms emerging. emerging. And in short, a crisis can break through economic structures that have been very successful in the past, but are slowly becoming an impediment and are no longer evolving. So that's the first one. When you see a crisis, don't think that this is only a time to address the short-term problems, but think also about the opportunities in the future. And then secondly, the problems might be so difficult that it might be needed to come up with new, with bold solutions. And I won't have the time to go in all the solutions that we have been discussing, but that is what we have been trying to do also, to see whether new solutions uh, are available. I'm at the university, I think I start with an economic uh, model. Uh, that is not because this is a reflection of reality, not at all, this is more than an oversimplification. But the reason I want to do that is because I think it captures some mechanism that are actually very relevant in the many areas that uh, we will uh, discuss. So a simple model of two regions in a country. Every uh, region, each region has a production function that is similar to the other production function, so identical uh, regions. Uh, we know from economics that you can have optimal demand equations for your capital and uh, your labor. Uh, and uh, we don't know yet uh, what the prices are because uh, demand for capital depends on the price for capital which is a function of interest rates, of depreciation, and of the, the price of investment goods. Labor demand is a function of uh, wages. We don't know yet uh, what these prices are, uh, but we already know from this simple uh, starting uh, point that there is a relation between uh, the factor prices. We assume that uh, the two regions produce the same good, we use the, the units of measurement that the price of that good is one, and so then we can look at the factor prices. And the relation you see in this last equation, that is what we call the factor price frontier, uh, or sometimes we call it the dual of the, the production function. And it basically shows that if the price of capital is going up, then the price of labor has to come down and the other way uh, around. 
That's the starting point. But we have to close that model to understand what is happening with that prices, with these prices, and so uh, assume perfect capital mobility. Capital can flow from one region uh, to the other. What does that mean? That means that in both region, regions, uh, the price of capital will be uh, the same. Uh, you see that reflected in the demand for capital, uh, dependent on the same uh, price of capital. And that means, because of that factor price frontier in the first uh, graph, that means also that in both regions, the wages would be the same, even if there's not mobility of, uh, of labor. Uh, and uh, if you solve that model, what you then see is that the share of uh, capital that is allocated in one region is exactly the same as the share of labor allocated uh, in one region. And the same is true for output being created in one region that follows exactly the share of labor. You can assume that labor is fixed in these regions, there's no mobility. Uh, but uh, you can also assume mobility, then people are going to the other region. Uh, that means just that capital will flow, production will flow, the ultimate solution for the country will not be different. Ultimately, the country will face as a whole this production function uh, at the end. But now, the model that I want to get to, and that is how do you get a dual economy? And you get a dual economy if you limit the, uh, the capital flow from one region to the other, or if you force prices of capital to differ, differ between the regions. So assume in region one, the price of capital is lower than the equilibrium price that we saw, uh, either because you want uh, a certain region to give lower interest rates, uh, you subsidize uh, education, you give them better land deals, there are other pr uh, prefer uh, preferential treatments that you can give because you think for some reason it is important to develop uh, that first uh, region. The price of capital in that region is lower than the equilibrium price. Uh, what does that mean? That has a lot of consequences in the whole economy. It means that in that first region, the price of labor will be higher than the equilibrium price. So you can pay a lot more for labor when you are in the region which, which has subsidized uh, capital. But it has consequences for the other uh, region also, because there it means now suddenly that the price of labor is lower than the equilibrium price if you have integrated market and the opposite for uh, for the price of capital and you see then also immediately that the result is that in the first region you have a lot more capital uh, <coughs> per, uh, per worker than in uh, the other region and labor productivity will be larger in the first region. Now we could go and explore all kinds of complicated things I just want to end this part by giving you a numerical example. For that, you have to choose the parameter. Let's just take 0.5. Let's assume that 10% of the workers live in that uh, first region uh, that gets uh, preferential treatment on uh, the capital market. And let's assume that that preferential treatment means that the price of capital is one third of the equilibrium price in the whole economy. What does that mean? That means that in the first region, the price of labor is three times the equilibrium price in the whole economy. It means that in that second region, people no longer have that equilibrium price of capital. They have a much higher price of capital, three times what it would have been if you have integrated markets. And then the opposite for the wages again. The wages are falling one third below that equilibrium price, which means that now suddenly the wages in that first sector are nine times the wages in that, uh, that second uh, uh, sector. Uh, you see that uh, now 90% of the capital is allocated to that first region that only has 10% of uh, the workers. Uh, that means that uh, the capital 
labor ratio is uh, <coughs> 81 times higher than, uh, than in the second region and labor productivity is nine times higher. So a single intervention in, uh, uh, in, the, in the capital market leads to a completely different structure uh, of the economy. Uh, and obviously for this, you, uh, you have to make sure that labor cannot freely flow from one region to the other because otherwise all the labor would go to where the wages are, uh, are high uh, and then you can't give preferential treatment because you end up with, uh, with one region. I put in red, and that's my last point on, uh, on the model, that if you add up the output that is being created in the two regions, now it's only 60% of the output that would have been created if you have no distortions in the capital market. So this is an example of a misallocation of resources. Suddenly, you have subsidized that first region that was uh, nice, but the whole country is worse off, and the second region is much worse off than that. And here is already a link to our profits. This means that the tax base is now suddenly much smaller than when you would not have interfered in the, in the market. And actually, the tax base is even smaller than the 60% that is here, because the people in that second region, they are so poor that there is no way that they can pay taxes. And so all the taxes are now coming from that first region, which in this example only produces 30% of what the whole economy could have produced with the large step. So this model of the dual economy starts with simple intervention, probably with good intentions, but it leads to a very, very distorted economy. So what are the applications of, uh, of this kind of a model? First of all, I talked all the time about regions, so you could think of lagging regions in a country. One region is preferred by the government, gets all the capital, the other region is, uh, is left out. But, interestingly, you could also think this might be a description of a formal, informal economy. Because we know that in the formal economy, there are companies and there is the government that has access to credit, that has relatively low interest rates, and that there is an informal economy where it's very difficult to get access to credit. So that's actually a subsidy on capital, exactly what I described in, uh, in the model. And for that to work, you need also to make sure that there are entry barriers for workers to go into the formal sector, otherwise the system uh, doesn't work. But there are entry barriers in the formal sector. The government uh, gives high wages, but the number of uh, jobs is limited. We call that insider-outsider policies. There are workers' unions that uh, protect the high wages, and they can only do that by keeping the formal uh, sector uh, small. You can even go a step further and say, okay, this kind of an idea might even explain, be relevant for other distortions that we are seeing. Uh, there are gender gaps, so there are groups in society that are not treated e equally, that don't have equal opportunities. That is another example of factor markets that are distorted. Uh, you can uh, think of other privileged uh, groups, uh, people from certain class have more opportunities than, uh, than other. Every time you end up in, uh, in an, a dual economy and uh, you see that there is inequality of opportunity, not everybody has the same opportunity to participate in the productive economy. And then finally, something that we are normally more thinking about, it can actually apply also to sectors in the economy. If you have a ready-made garment uh, sector, 
and for very good reasons uh, that had pre privileged uh, preferential treatment had better access to uh, capital uh, then uh, that sector uh, will grow generate a lot of output but the consequence for the rest of the economy is that they are poor and they are less competitive in international markets and that if you have grown the ready-made garment industry a lot then at some point you want other, other industries to come up and that is very difficult because they are basically in a bad equilibrium where they are poor, they don't have access to capital it's very difficult to uh, grow them so that's basically the, the concept a couple of illustrations uh, of work that we are uh, have published over the last uh, couple of, uh, of years I won't go deep into that because it is so much it's too difficult but here just a graph of uh, the size of the informal sector in different developing regions the first one is South Asia then East Asia Sub-Saharan Africa Latin America the Middle East and North Africa and then Europe and Central Asia and so what you are seeing is that the size of the informal sector if you exclude agriculture if you would ex include agriculture it would be even larger if you exclude agriculture the size of the informal sector is more than 70 percent and it is stable it is not coming down and it has been like that for decades as development economists economist, we think that slowly when a country is growing the informal sector will be absorbed by the formal sector it is not happening and the reason it is not happening might be in that small model that I showed you that the informal sector is in a bad equilibrium everybody sees that their labor productivity is low not because those were different people not because they had different uh, opportunities but just because they don't have the capital and that starts reinforcing uh, itself. I want to get the next slide. Yeah. Okay, uh, very quickly uh, on the informal sector. Uh, this slide summarizes that there are two views on informality uh, in the world. One is that there's informality because it's a choice of people in the informal sector. People don't want to pay taxes. They don't want to grow large because then you have to commit yourself to all kinds of regulations. And so the problem is in the informal sector. The other explanation is basically the model that I showed you. The informal sector is just extreme. You have the insider outsider model, they are the outsiders, they don't have the tools and they are in, uh, in a bad equilibrium. When we work on the informal sector, we try to, uh, to use both views and we, we know that there's heterogeneity in the uh, informal sector. But when we look at South Asia, then almost all of the informality fits that second uh, explanation. They are outsiders. And why is that? That is because almost all of the companies in the informal sector are micro enterprises. They are one person enterprises, two person enterprises. They are way smaller than the enterprises that would be close to the formal sector. At one point you could decide not to grow anymore because you don't want to pay taxes, you don't want all the labor regulations and you don't want all the other stuff. That's not true in South Asia. In South Asia these companies are way small. That's an evidence that for South Asia that insider-outsider model applies much more. Then one slide on informality. There's so much more to talk about informality, but just one slide, and that's a bit of a positive one. In our view, the problem is in the formal sector. You could say, okay, these privileges should not exist. The wages are too high. They should come down so that everybody can benefit. That's incredibly difficult. 
it's incredibly difficult to go against these vested interests. And so what we are looking for is, are there opportunities to increase productivity in the informal sector without trying to absorb them in the current formal sector that has regulations that can never apply to the whole economy because they are way too generous for workers, they are way too generous for, uh, for firms. And one of the opportunities is the new technology that is boosted also by the crisis, that is e-commerce uh, platforms, uh, that is other digital technologies, and what it shows here for formal and for informal firms that both are actually benefiting from having access to markets by selling on uh, e-commerce platforms. They're even, even willing to pay uh, taxes. Their revenues are going up and their, uh, their markets are uh, broadening. Not true for all uh, informal firms, but there is an important part of them that benefits. So that's positive. I want to skip to another topic that we have been working on, and that is still related to that small model. And that is the topic of inequality of opportunity or uh, limited intergenerational mobility. And basically that's again an uh, example of not having a level playing field in your factor markets. So what do we mean by inequality of opportunity? We look at the outcomes, either in education or in the labor market or in your consumption uh, opportunities, and we try to calculate to what extent are these determined by your own efforts or to what extent are these determined by factors in your background that you can't change. Factors like the education level of your parents, the location where you were born, whether you were born in a rural area or in an urban area, uh, whether you are male or female, uh, all things that you can't influence, and if they uh, uh, determine your outcomes, uh, then you have inequality of opportunity, which is, to some extent, a lot worse than actual inequality. Inequality of opportunity is not fair for an individual, because you don't have the same opportunities. It can threaten social cohesion because people feel that groups are excluded from society. And as an economist, you end up in that small model in the beginning that economically it is a misallocation of resources, it's an underutilization of capacity, and you have a completely distorted economy. Another related measure is uh, intergenerational mobility, and that calculates if you come from the background, either in education or income, of the bottom 50, uh, what is your probability that you end up in the top 25% of the distribution in a country? And uh, if everybody would have the same opportunity, it would, just, would be 25%. But it is, in many countries, much lower than that, another signal that that everybody has the same opportunity. Here, an illustration of that intergenerational mobility uh, for education. What if your parents were in the bottom half? What is the probability that uh, you end up in the top 25% of the educated uh, people? The yellow bars, and so the higher you are uh, in this graph, uh, the higher the probability, and the better it is, more equal uh, society is. The yellow uh, bars are uh, uh, are the developing regions that we, uh, that we distinguish in the World Bank. So at the top is East Asia and then MENA, Europe, Central Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, and lower is South Asia. And that is worse. Yeah? That is worse. That measure of, of inequality of opportunity is worse in South Asia even than in Africa. It's a huge uh, underutilization of potential, and, and it potentially this, this is a source of social uh, unrest. Now, this was for education. Uh, you can do that uh, also for, uh, uh, for, for consumption, for, for income. Uh, what we calculate uh, here for the 
population is a lot of the inequality, not surprisingly, uh, is linked to uh, the location where you were born, which part of the country or whether in a rural area or an urban area. So in terms of the small model, we are back to uh, two regions in uh, a country that don't have the same opportunity. Not having the same opportunity in capital and, and accumulating uh, human capital basically means that the other region has subsidized uh, access to uh, capital. So this is uh, another example uh, where you can see uh, flip through very quickly on the on the right uh, now a measure for uh, consumption uh, and uh, between 40 and 60 percent uh, of the ultimate distribution is explained by factors that you can't uh, can't influence in uh, in South Asia and that again is much worse than uh, in other regions I think a final slide on this uh, story of inequality of opportunity that again is uh, an illustration of distortion in market. Uh, if you look at demand for equity, how many people want redistribution of income? That is by far highest in South Asia when you compare it to other regions. And it is actually growing in uh, South Asia. While if you look at the outcomes of actual inequality, that is not even that high in South Asia, although it is difficult to compare uh, that across the regions. And so that is not a coincidence. Yeah. If you feel that you are unfairly treated, that you have never had a chance, then you say something is wrong. I want a redistribution. But redistribution can come, but it doesn't solve the underlying problem. The underlying problem is that the markets are not organized in an efficient way. One uh, not final but almost final uh, example that is very much linked to that inequality of, uh, of opportunity, that is the female labor force uh, participation in South Asia where female labor force participation is much lower than in other regions. Uh, you see that here on the left uh, graph. Uh, the bottom uh, line is uh, the Middle East and North Africa, uh, and then comes South Asia, and female labor force participation has been declining and is now on par with uh, the Middle East. Well, when you look at the right-hand graph, where you see the male labor force uh, participation, you see South Asia at the top. And so there's a huge uh, gender uh, gap. Uh, that means that people don't have the same opportunity. It means that factor markets are segmented. It means there is a huge underutilization of capacity and has far more consequences than what you might think if you just look at the participation of, uh, of women. Uh, you can calculate it also in a different way when you follow cohorts. The cohort that was born in 1940, so a very old cohort, and then the more younger cohorts towards the right hand side of the graph. And what we are seeing is that there is actually no shift in, uh, in South Asia in none of the countries that are here shown. So for decades and decades, it, this has been uh, true. And that is weird because if we look at other variables that normally explain people like education or like fertility, education has gone up quite a bit. Not necessarily with equal opportunities, but on average it has gone up quite a bit in South Asia. Fertility is up and down in all these countries. Red on the line is, uh, is Bangladesh. And still, nothing happened in the labor market. That means a lot of women are educated, but when they get married, they drop out of the labor force, or for other reasons, they just don't have the same access to, uh, to resources in, uh, in the labor market. The well-known U-shaped curve uh, 
that uh, that exists throughout the world and actually within countries when you look at income distribution uh, also uh, what you see is the female labor force participation on uh, the y-axis and a measurement of per capita income on the horizontal uh, axis and you see that when households are very poor then female labor force participation is high because you can't afford not to work, everybody has to earn some money, then households are getting richer, and then the women tend to drop out of uh, the labor market, uh, the participation rate is coming down, and then the countries are growing, and the wages are going up, and then you see that it just becomes too costly because of the foregone uh, earnings uh, to stay at home, and you see that it rising again. Now, most countries in South Asia are at the bottom, so you would argue perhaps it is not that strange that it hasn't gone up because it follows that U-shaped uh, curve, and you have to become still richer before you can expect that it goes up. The big problem is that the red dots, all South Asian countries, are far below the line. So something is different in South Asia than in the rest uh, of the world. It's especially true for India and Pakistan and Afghanistan. Less so for Bangladesh, but also there. On average, there is a 20 percentage point difference between what it should be and what it is. Uh-oh. Another potential bottom Yeah, I think And so I won't go into that, and, and I have colleagues here uh, who've done a lot of work on that, so we try to explain what it was. And uh, we can explain that by measuring uh, uh, norms, gender norms, both what you think yourself uh, of these norms and what you think that others uh, are thinking of these norms. And one of the conclusions is, and that's one of these bold interventions, is that you can't get there by just the normal interventions of uh, childcare or safer transportation. It's all very important, but ultimately there needs to be a critical mass that these norms start, start changing and that you have the normal relationships uh, back. So my final uh, uh, illustration of that small model uh, in the beginning, but also very relevant for Bangladesh. What, what uh, this final uh, chart is showing is the share of ready-made garments. ready-made garments uh, in total exports of Bangladesh. Really a striking uh, figure, yeah? It's almost all of the exports are created in that sector, and if anything, that share is increasing. And it could be an illustration of that small model. You have a sector that has been supported, that is doing well, and then you have a virtuous cycle, circle, that once you're doing well, then you get even better access to capital, there are even better political uh, connections, it uh, is much easier for you to push the priorities in, uh, in the policies, and then you have the other sectors, that don't have that access and they are in a vicious cycle. They are in a bad equilibrium because as they don't have the access to capital, it's very difficult for them to compete. They get poorer, they remain smaller, then the banks find it even more difficult to, uh, to go to them and get some uh, collateral and let alone that they can be very effective in, uh, in export markets. That is a problem. It was not a problem in the past because 
the sector has served Bangladesh very well, but you cannot continue to grow in one sector. Uh, somebody in Bangladesh asked, uh, told me that there's a lot of interest in how Korea did it, South Korea did it, because basically started off in the 1960s, uh, uh, early 70s, uh, the same way after a war, uh, very densely populated, resource poor, more or less the same income level, and look where South Korea is, is now. That was not a smooth process in South Korea. That came with sharp changes in policies. It even came with changes in political systems. It came with changes in priorities. Uh, they realized that even if you have uh, infant industry arguments, supports, that you need an exit strategy. That, that you cannot rely on that sector and that you have to go to that other sector. And then there was an enormous focus on education and education for everybody with equality of opportunity for, for everybody. So this picture is important, yeah? This picture is important because it shows the success in the past, but at the same time this sector becomes a bottleneck going, uh, uh, going uh, forward. Okay, my final slide, uh, the uh, conclusion. The success of Bangladesh. And I've seen a lot of Bangladesh. There has been enormous, impressive success. But it is no guarantee for diversification. It is no guarantee for strong, sustained future growth. At some point, you have to reinvent the economy. At some point, you have to think, how can you explore the production potential that is underutilized at the moment. And it is underutilized, and I've shown that with examples, but I don't have enough time to go into details there, but it is underexploited because there's not a level playing field. The factor markets are still such that not everybody has the same opportunity, and then you end up in a dual economy. That's true for every country in the world, but what these numbers are showing it is worse for South Asia and it is worse for Bangladesh in South Asia compared to the rest of the world. Bangladesh is not necessarily doing badly against, compared with the neighbors, but compared to the rest of the world, it's a problem. And so I also think that that lack of inclusion can underlie the current macroeconomic problems that we are all talking about the fiscal problems, the balance of payment problems, which then result in the, uh, the, the, the downward pressure on the currency. And then we realize that monetary policy cannot solve that. They can try to do that, but very limited. But very quickly, they run into uh, limitations. And underlying force might well be that narrow tax base. If you only have 10%, of GDP and taxes, and you have all these demands coming there, then you run a fiscal deficit, and a fiscal deficit translates to very quickly to a current account deficits. And if you don't have enough financing coming in, then you have a balance of payment problem. And a fiscal deficit might actually be itself also a form of a dual economy. It could be a reflection of <coughs> financial repression, that the government somehow is able to borrow a lot at home at relatively low interest rates, but that has consequences. It has consequences for the rest of the economy. You end up in a dual economy. So that story that we normally link to something like uh, Future growth, that's trends that take a long time, could actually be very relevant for the current uh, situation. And I'm of an opinion, and we have quite a bit of debate there in the World Bank, that in a current crisis, you should look at those problems. You should take the opportunity to start changing them. If only because 
that actually helps to support of reform programs also. If part of the reform is, okay, let's take serious now the people who never had the same opportunities. Let's rethink the vested interests that have evolved in an economy. Let's make that part of a reform program. Then you're talking about the long-term development, which actually that could be uh, also in the longer, medium, longer run, a solution of a, a solution of the fiscal problem, because it doesn't work just to raise interest rates and to reduce subsidies if it's only a small part of the economy that participates in the productive economy and that can pay the taxes. It doesn't work like that. You have to broaden uh, the tax base. Then finally, you really have to think about bold actions. This is no longer, okay, we understand some interventions of the past and let's go. I think with this vast and formal sector that hasn't changed for decades, you really have to think if you can't change the vested interest in the formal sector, try something else. Try something that increases the productivity in the informal sector without imposing all the regulations of the formal sector. And start using now the, uh, the new technologies that have come up. And there are huge opportunities there. I don't have it in this, this presentation, but we have done a lot of work on what we call services-led growth, which is an opportunity for South Asia. There are all kinds of reasons why services can take over the role in, in uh, lower and middle income countries, which used to be played by manufacturing. All kinds of reasons why services can, can do that now. They absorb a lot of people, they are more tradable, you get export revenues, and they start producing now the, the, the goods that make the rest of the economy more productive. But those are all things that manufacturing did. Services can do that. South Asia, including Bangladesh, uh, can, uh, uh, can, can lead there. And, and if you look at the services exports of India and Bangladesh, they have been involved. And that might be the future uh, of it. So that is one of these bold things. But the other one is human labor force participation. Let's not think that with some interventions this will be solved. Ultimately, if you are serious about it, that everybody should have equal opportunities, you have to start discussing what drives these norms. If interventions are not successful, you have to ask, why is that? There was an inheritance law, but still the daughters are not getting, getting the, the money. So what keeps them? And how do we change that? The same with dowries, and the same with, uh, with land owner, uh, ownership. And, and can that be changed? And what, what do we learn from other countries, how these norms are changing? It's not us coming in and pointing that these norms are not good, and then they say that they must, must be changed because in my own country, in the Netherlands, we have we have a history of very similar uh, situation. But but if you want to be successful, these norms have to be addressed till there is a critical mass where people start thinking, "Wow, I'm not alone. I always thought that this was not right, but I thought the rest of society saw differently." And there was just no way of pushing that because these norms, they are eternal. But actually, it might be true that many other people think like that. And, and you see that suddenly people realize that they can change, and then they change. That's a bold action, but I think that's needed. Thank you so much.